Hello everybody, my name is Boulevard and welcome to a patch rundown. You're either very deep in the patch note rundown rabbit hole or you know who I am if you stumbled across this video just in case it's the former. I'm a caster and an analyst. I focus pretty solely on tournament content for Legends of Runeterra so I might be looking at these patch notes a little bit differently than your favorite content creator. Also I'm going to be going buffs and then nerfs not in the order in which these patch notes are actually written out. Also I'm going to timestamp that below just in case you want to skip around like you only want to see me talk about the nerfs. Also, I'm going to blow through things that just like are not for the competitive community, which means probably a few of the buffs, the ones that you look at this and you're like, OK, this card was unplayed. It got buffed. It will probably still be unplayed. Going to skip those. So let's get into it. So kicking things off with Karma, obviously three health to four is an absolutely massive change. It's one of the biggest changes that you can make to a unit in Legends of Runeterra. A lot of things kill at three health, not a lot of things kill at four health. More than that for Karma specifically is the ability to block a little bit more freely because if you are playing a Karma deck, you have probably found yourself in a situation where you have to block with your Karma before. Now you've got a little bit more survivability on that and at least we'll get an additional resource out of your opponent if you have to block something and then they need to finish it off with a Mystic Shot or a Ping or what have you. The problem that I have with Karma that's a little bit more overarching is that it feels like a lot of Ionia spells don't really care about getting doubled. Deny, Nopify, Recalls, Stuns, Barrier Spells. These are not things that really change based on if you're doing them once or doing them twice. Yeah, it could be a little nice to get through Spell Shield in the late game, but I'm trying to imagine a Spell Shield deck that you're going to struggle with or a deck that has such prominent Spell Shield that you're like, yes, I can now Will of Ionia through the Spell Shield, that you're not just like dying earlier on in the game to that Spell Shield threat. Kaisa specifically comes to mind. Maybe not as much with the Supercharge change, but that remains to be seen. My point is that Karma just doesn't seem to synergize with Ionia specifically super duper well. But between... You know, the, the play cast change, people's just inherent love of Karma Ezreal, that's definitely something that's going to get experimented with. I don't know how long it's going to last, but we, I would definitely expect to see some Karma Ezreal at the Mastering Your Terra open this weekend. And then we'll kind of gauge from there the success of it, if it's something that's going to persist into the seasonal, if it does, if that is going to be a Swiss deck list or just a top 32 deck list. Because a lot of control decks that we see right now Feel the Rush, Jace Heimerdinger, they're very proactive as well. They don't want to take it to turn 10 to kill you. They want to kill you on curve. Like, FTR wants to kill you on, like, turn 8, right? They want to play a ramp spell. They want to FTR as soon as they get to 9 mana and 3 spell mana. And they generally want to kill you right then and there. So Karma's not really even just getting to vibe with the other control decks in the meta. And I'm trying to think of the last time that Karma was meta, right? And all I can really think of, the, the latest memory that I have is... Uh, what am I and his subset of players were really big on like Karma Lee Sin, which I think they probably could have played Zoe Lee Sin and had just as much success. And prior to that, it was like Zoe Karma, which if I remember correctly, was like mostly a Lee Sin counter and had something else going for it. I don't remember what it was. I think it was mostly like an Eye of the Dragon deck. So you had to like give some beyond into Eye of the Dragon which with that interaction gone, I don't think we're seeing a comeback on Zoe Karma. I think a lot of Targon Karma decks are actually really hurt by that change specifically because that was a finishing piece as well where you could double up like the Infernum. Maybe Aphelios Karma is something, but I'm really not optimistic for it, mostly because of the Crescendum changes. And I think that that was like just being able to get that Eye of the Dragon access was really big for Karma decks. And ultimately not optimistic for this to have really any impact, but we have so many Karma simps in the community, Majin Bay especially, that if there is a Karma deck, it's going to be found very quickly. So at least we have that going for us. We'll, we'll know pretty much right away if, if there is anything here. Majin Bay is already hard at work at it, I'm sure. If he finds anything, Kevor will play it in the seasonal, and we'll all get to rejoice from there. But I'm just, I'm not in love with like Karma's identity right now. I think the game is just a little bit too fast for her. And I think we continue to just push the game in a direction that is too fast for Karma. Even if you wanted to do like Karma Yasuo, right? Because Yasuo just got a bunch of support. People were talking about like Katarina Yasuo. Maybe you could do like Karma Yasuo. But again, the stuns and the recalls are, first of all, the recalls never matter because they're not going to like double up on the Yasuo because you can only recall the thing once and then the second spell will fizzle. But even like double stuns with Karma to level the Yasuo faster. If your Yasuo is not fucking leveled by turn 10, <laughs> the game's over anyway. And once the Yasuo is leveled, even if you can establish a leveled Karma and a leveled Yasuo, I don't think you're going to get uh, sort of a good... Like, it's not going to matter. Because if you double stun something, 
Yasuo's first five damage probably killed it. You don't need to do that twice. The more I think about it, though, there was actually a more recent example of Karma's competitiveness that I that I can think of now that I uh, really like put my mind to it, and that was was Victor Lee Sin. There was Victor Karma as well, and again, not super optimistic for it, just because a lot of the PNZ early game has been taking hits over the last couple of patches. We just got a nerf to Boomba Boon. Ballistic Bot took a nerf before that. Reggie took a nerf before that. And those were all cards that, if I remember correctly, were a part of that Victor Karma package. Me, I'm sure someone will look into it. And I think Victor Karma is much more likely than Karma Ezreal making a comeback. But at the end of the day, I think that PNZ has just taken too many early game nerfs that we'll, we'll kind of see how it goes. But if, if you're looking for a place to start, it's almost certainly Karma Victor. And you just kind of have to suss out whether or not those PNZ nerfs were impactful enough to really push you off the Karma. But even then, you're really just kind of looking for this burn finish through Karma, right? Or like doubling up on the created cards through Victor, double keyword on the Victor, stuff like that. But with Scout removed from the pool, like there's just been a lot of nerfs to the region combination of Piltover and Zon and Ionia since we last saw Karma Victor, which I believe actually did top a seasonal. And I think it was pretty recently. I think it was Curious Journey that it did it. But I think after that, we started to see all these nerfs and uh, just not not feeling it, Karma. Not feeling it. Nar is getting a cute little quality of life change where if you have an existing Poke Stick in hand, Nar will set it to zero mana instead of one mana, which is a nice quality of life change. But Nar really fell off when losing that one attack and, you know, persisted through that to an extent. But I think just a lot of the archetypes that Nar fit into and really just like Bandle City as a whole has not survived the shift in meta because the best Nar deck was Bandle Tree. Now, Bandle Tree doesn't exist anymore. That's the one time I will say that like they actually nerfed a card so hard that they just straight up removed it from the game was Bandle Tree. So that doesn't exist anymore. Then we look at like burn decks that Nar was a part of, like Bandle City and Noxus Burn, I think was the most popular. That I'm a little bit more optimistic for, making a comeback, not even so much just because of this Nar buff, but because people put it back on the map and we already had like, what am I just played Triple Burn in the Online League series recently, 4LW has been really big on this sort of New Age Pirate deck, it had some tentacle cards in it, I think Tentacle Smash was in there, so we'll kind of see how he feels about that, but I, I don't think that the Tentacle Smash was like such a big thing that that's going to kill 4LW's Pirate list. And then like Annie Jin is something that has maintained like a top 5 presence on ladder, not phenomenal in tournament. It shows up every now and then, but maybe you could filter that out with uh, a Nar burn deck and then you pair that with Pirates and Spider Gwen and suddenly you've got like a new age triple burn lineup because burn has really been struggling to find its third deck for a long time. Spiders and Pirates have gotten really big updates recently. So yeah, maybe Nar is what we needed to actually put those Bandle City burn decks back on the map, but I'm worried that just too many cards around it have been nerfed. A lot of the Bandle City aggro package is just not what it used to be. Bandle Pirates, uh, the Gangplank, I think it was Gangplank Twisted Fate that we saw at like Worlds 2021, just remains to be one of the most nerfed decks in history. Not as a direct result of the, that deck specifically, but as a lot of other parts of Bilgewater and Bandle City. And I'm just not optimistic for Nar to really break a new space into the meta. Like, I think it was the Curious Journey season was like, it felt forever. And I remember that it felt forever because, or maybe it was Magic Misadventure. Yeah, I think it was Magic Misadventure where like I hit Masters with like Nar Swain. And then before that season was over, that deck was so far gone that it was like, I couldn't even remember it. And I don't think we're going to get like Nar Swain making a comeback. I think that like Swain is just pushed out. Really any Noxus control that you want to do is just kind of pushed out by the existence of Ravenbloom Conservatory right now. And you know, that took a nerf this patch. So maybe that'll open up a little bit of room for these other Noxus control decks to come in. But I don't think that's going to be the case because... They're, they're not going to be as good as old Conservatory was. And I think just like, just because Conservatory falls out doesn't mean these new decks come up and take their place because Conservatory wasn't doing super well against the top ends of the meta regardless. So I don't think something that is a downgrade of old Conservatory is going to come in and, and, and really make waves here. So, you know, Nar's cute. I'm sure that he'll find something. I'm not sure he deserves to find something, but it, it, you know, anytime that you buff a champion like this and you just kind of get people looking at it again, I'm sure that someone will find something. And if I had to guess, I'd say it's going to be in a triple aggro line or not even necessarily a triple aggro lineup, but it'll be some kind of like Bandle City Noxus burn. I think Control Nar is, is kind of dead. And uh, I don't think that's really coming back just from a meta standpoint more so than like Nar's specific state. But yeah, you know, we'll see. This actually does do pretty good for Trundle Timelines. You know, that's a deck that has been hanging around 
and some people play it mono trundle some people play it caitlin been a while since i've seen anyone play it with nar and it, it's funny because like th that would be the nar deck like the freljord nar deck is so irrelevant for this actual change but you know i, I, I could see it i could see narsonique in his way back in there people deciding that like caitlin's not the wave but i don't know i, I think caitlin's in a really good spot so Sorry, Nar. I don't. I, I just don't really see this doing anything. Maybe down the line we can buff Nar again, but I, I don't really blame the devs for being light-handed with Nar because he was so dominant on. I think Nar was like the most dominant champion on release that we've ever seen, getting like eight out of eight top eights at, at a bunch of tournaments. So I'm not too upset to see him still sidelined. Zillion's careful preparations is a very needed change, and I think this is only the second time that they have changed a champion's champion spell, the first one being Lee Sin going from Dragon's Rage to Sonic Wave Resonating Strike. And I still kind of feel like it should happen to Katarina. You know, Death Lotus is really not a great Katarina spell, but we'll get there. You know, I am more so just happy to see them taking the initiative to change champions, champion spells again because I think that's a really cool way to look at some older champions and bring them back in. Lately, we've been really big on this tri-champion spread, and I think a big part of that is that a lot of new champion champion spells kind of suck, where back in the day, you'd look at, like, Draven, and it's like, well, I could go for this triple champion split, but, like, I really want to jam Draven's in here because I just want more copies of Whirling Death. One of Swain's big strengths was, like, in metas where Ravenous Flock was good. You just want to play Swain because you're getting more Ravenous Flocks than your opponent. And I, I always thought that that was a really cool mechanic that Legends of Runeterra could do a little bit more to take advantage of. And so I think that changing things like this is really, really cool. And obviously this is going to be, I would say, a really big buff for Zillion Echo because it now gives you an extra predict while you already have the Zillion in play. And they were really never casting the seven mana spell anyway. And your opponent already was sort of leaving the Zillion out because you don't want to kill that Zillion and then they just get more time bombs in the deck and have an easier time leveling the Zillion. So I actually think that this is like a, a really big buff for Zillion Echo specifically. Um, and maybe there'll be some other Zillion decks. I know like the, the time printer time bomb printer deck is like it really hasn't done anything in tournaments as far as i remember but i do think that zillion echo being um a really good pet deck for some really good players i, I could see this change like actually being super impactful for the seasonal and, and one that you absolutely should not sleep on. So the Cosmic Binding going to six chimes from three is a really hard buff to talk about without talking about the Bard nerf. So I'm going to kind of skip over this one and I'll, I'll come back to it a little bit when we actually get to the Bard nerf. But Cosmic Binding was a crutch for Bard decks that were in regions with low interaction. And we kind of moved away from it organically. And Cosmic Binding, this is a buff that isn't really going to be felt unless a champion comes out in a region with low interaction down the line and Bard needs to come back to this spell. But for this patch, this is nothing. Much like when I first started playing League of Legends, Evelyn's just kind of the worst champion in the game. So this hate spike buff is really hard for me to contextualize on because Evelyn has been historically bad across the board. Tournament, ladder, normals, friendlies, lab whatever. It's bad everywhere. And I don't see hate spike seeing play outside of Evelyn decks. Maybe if we get a return to like Thresh Nasus, but even then they're just going to be more focused on things like Vile Feast. I don't think they're really looking to like chuck their zero ones at other units. They'd rather glimpse beyond it. Like the, the space on a self slay deck is so tight that I don't think hate spike is ever really going to make the cut. And the random husk, like just the random nature of the husk makes this a pretty unappealing option. But that's really all I can say on it. Like, this this just doesn't really feel like it, it's going to do anything. So the first thing I want to point out about this Harsh Winds buff is that nobody thought to mention that Anivia's Harsh Winds is also going to 5 mana, which just leads me to believe that everybody who works on Legends of Runeterra has forgotten about Anivia, which is very funny to me. I'd like to say that this is a big boost for Frostbite Midrange, especially, you know, sort of pairing this with the bloody business buff that's elsewhere in the patch. And I, I think it will be down the line, but I don't think it is right now. Because when I look through this patch, what I see is a lack of nerfs onto Heimerdinger Jace. And with Thralls getting knocked down a peg and Kaisa getting knocked down a peg, especially the change of second skin to slow speed from burst speed, now I can like Vile Feast Valor and you don't just get Scout Challenger. I, I think we're definitely pushing in the direction of a control meta. And that will almost certainly include a, a Shadow Isle Freljord deck. Now, FTR has main decked Harshwinds in the past. I 
If there's a lot of FTR mirrors, maybe we move in that direction. This is actually a pretty nice buff to Anivia in that regard as well. But for the most part, I think it's going to be FTR. But unless we're seeing a lot of FTR mirrors, it's probably still just going to be flash freeze in the main. If Viego comes back in a big way, then like there's two atrocity decks in the meta. But again, that's still not something that pushes harsh winds over flash freeze. And I think that a lot of these decks are still just going to be pretty singular threat. Maybe Harsh Winds is the way to go. I think it's going to be Flash Freeze more or less across the board. Maybe this pops up as like a one of in the FTR list. I don't think this really pushes a Nivea over FTR. But for the most part, I just I really think that we're pushing in a, in a control direction. A lot of Shadow Isle control specifically, which is bad for Frostbite midrange because they're very susceptible to Ruination. Um, Vengeance isn't great for them either. They don't have a lot of combat tricks against these sort of hard removal spells. We'll see how it goes. But ultimately, I think that this buff is... It's fine. You know, I, I don't think it's going to do insane things to the play rate of Harsh Winds. And like I said, I, I don't think it's going to let Anivia overtake FTR, which is sort of the big thing that you would look for on a, a buff to a champion spell. But ultimately, it is, it is a little meta dependent. I could see this being played as a one or two of an FTR. But ultimately, I think like Flash Freeze still wins on the day. And that's... Uh, it's kind of that. I think down the line, if control does get nerfed a little bit, this is going to be really, really good for Frostbite midrange because with all of the buffs that they've received, this is now half of Ash's level up. And then the Ash attacks, boom, you're three quarters of the way there. Um, I think this is very, very good for, for FBM. And maybe in a couple of months, we'll see it really shine. We'll probably see people play it at the seasonal. We'll probably see people top with it at the seasonal. I think there were a few Frostbite midrange players that topped in EMEA and the Americas uh, during the world walker seasonal so you know that deck just keeps getting buffs just keeps getting better but i think that if we are moving into a very control centric field that it, it's going to struggle more than it did previously but yeah that's that's kind of that on on harsh winds <laughs> kajigan the ruined buff is big in the sense that kajigan used to not have an ability and now he has an ability but it, i tried making like a, a more dragon centric like shivana pantheon a little while ago and I just found challengers to not be in a phenomenal spot. Like I'd, I'd attack the Kaisa and they would just hourglass it. And it's like, okay, you know, I'm spending all my mana on these dragons. I don't really have the room for like a single combat or, or a concerted strike to like hold up all that interaction. Um, quicksand existing just also makes challengers feel pretty bad. And ultimately, you know, maybe down the line, you feel good about getting this off an egghead researcher or an eclipse dragon because eclipse dragon actually could be a little bit more relevant now with all of the Targon buffs and the invoke buffs, but I think that is where, if you're going to see Kadrigan in tournament play, it's because it came out of an Eclipse Dragon, and it feels really good now because, like, you know, my Eclipse Dragon is an 8-8 with Challenger, but it would have done that anyway because you could grant Challengers to Dragons. But ultimately, like, that's that's really all you're going to see out of Kadrigan. Mark of the Storm, this is obviously a really big buff, right, from 2 damage to 3, but we're not seeing people play the Recycle Cannon game anymore, and maybe that's just because the payoff wasn't big enough. Now you get to kill Petrocyte Broadwing, can't kill karma anymore but ultimately the mark of the storm thing just kind of feels like a buff for people that are like just an, a cherry on top of the sunday that is all of the other self bounce buffs that we got this patch the ones that feel kind of irrelevant i like i was looking at those buffs and i was looking at this patch as a whole and like the rundown that they had given on twitter on like here's the infographic here's what we're buffing and i was looking at all those buffs and i was like wow half of these are fucking irrelevant and it led me down this pipeline of like almost making a video that I scrapped into almost making an article that I scrapped into like almost making a twit longer that I scrapped into just a comment that I figured I'd make in a video eventually, which was I became very interested in how often had the Legends of Runeterra team taken an unplayable card, buffed it, and then it started seeing play because I look back at the last balance patch that we got and there's like three or four Bandal City cards that are, are just nothing cards. They're unplayable. They got buffed. They're still unplayable. And... As I continued down the pipeline, I kind of just came to the conclusion that, like, these buffs just are not for the competitive community. They are for people that really like these decks and are only winning, like, 30% of the time, and we want to get them to, like, a 40% of the time winning. And that's what I feel like a lot of these buffs are trying to do. They're just not for us. And that's kind of why I scrapped the video and the article and all that kind of stuff. But the Kennen buff could be, because we're moving Bard out of Ionia, which means... Ari Kennen might be playable again. I'm trying to remember what nerfs specifically we took to Ari Kennen Go Hard that made it no longer playable. Um, I think it was a health on Ari and something else. But if we're moving into a control dominated meta, then the self bounce archetype actually did pretty well in there because you can get a lot of tempo off of dodging something with a recall. 
maybe Kennen's not the best card to be playing in that deck now. Maybe we do have something a little bit better. It's one of those things we're going to kind of have to look at and see. But, you know, if you are talking about this in the context of like, hey, it's a good anti-control deck, I, I don't think the extra damage on the mark matters too much. I think you're... Uh, everything that I can think of in a control deck either has four health or it has two. So, like, it just it doesn't feel like uh, the, the mark change really matters unless we move back to, like, Ken and Ezreal, but Ezreal just caught a couple of nerfs, so not super optimistic for that either. Uh, ultimately, I don't I don't really see this mark change doing much, but I, I'm willing to be surprised on that one. So as you've picked up on by now, it's going to be a very long, very in-depth patch review, and I'm about to talk about Starbone. Because historically, when you look at all 10 seasonals and we look at the best performing decks through Swiss, Lee Sin number one, Draven Ezreal number two, Invoke is actually number three or number four. And this isn't just a, oh, well, you know, it got a lot of percentage points in the early seasonals because it's one of the only decks that's been around since day one. But even as recently as A Curious Journey, uh, this is Real Prism Sword's top 32 Invoke deck. It was Victor and Glorious Evolution. And then outside of that, it's all Targon, baby. We go back to the Mountain Scryer style of play, which with the big buff to Lunari Duskbringer and, and Pale Cascade, uh, Diana has received some buffs. And like, that is a potential champion that we've seen before is like Diana of Felios. Maybe go a little bit more Nightfall heavy into the Invoke package. But if we are actually looking at a control heavy meta, then Invoke is a, an archetype that gets a lot of value out of just the inactivity that Control wants to throw at it. And they're very susceptible, like very uh, resilient rather to sweepers, where you look at Mountain Scryer and it's one of the only backline units that has like three health and can just sit there and survive these things, especially if you're playing like Guiding Touches or you're willing to throw a Star Shaping onto it after it gets avalanched because you're not throwing them at face because you're playing a control matchup. And like three health is just an awkward breakpoint for control decks specifically right now, where I think that if you can get down a Starbone or even two, it's, it's a huge deal. And you can take the minus one in a control matchup because you're just invoking so often, and especially with the buff to Traveler now being at four attack, just everything is going for invoke right now. And I think that in this vengeance style meta that we're moving towards, you know, Great Beyond is still a house. We might even just move back to Great Beyond Atrocity style gameplay here. And that even lets you, you know, explore some of the Nightfall options that you have in Shadow Isle uh, as like an additional little splash. But I definitely think that like Mountain Scryer decks are about to make a big comeback. Maybe not so much on ladder. Maybe it is more of a tournament scene thing because that's where I think control is going to be the most dominant. No one really wants to play control on ladder. It's not as EV heavy for climbing LP, especially as everybody floods back to the ladder because we all took a break during the Kaisa era and are now ready to go for our 7-2 seating. You might not see Invoke really shine there because you won't see control shine there. And maybe Invoke is just good enough anyway. Uh, maybe it runs Starbone, maybe it doesn't, but this is definitely one of those buffs that is going to get people thinking about the deck again and refining it much quicker than it would be otherwise. And I would say that Invoke, uh, it could even shoot up to like a top five deck come time for the seasonal. Not necessarily Starbone Invoke specifically, but just if we accumulate all of the Mountain Scryer decks into one archetype, I think that is something that you could see uh, perform within the top five of the seasonal. So that's probably the hottest take I have. It's I, I say it's a hot take, but like, I haven't watched any other patch rundowns. I haven't, like, I don't know if that's a hot take or not. Maybe everybody has that take. Maybe it's a scalding hot take. I actually have no frame of reference on that, but that is um, probably the, the potentially hottest take that I have uh, for this patch is that Invoke uh, might just be a top five deck for the season. So the bloody business buff, obviously very good for Frostbite midrange, probably the most competitive deck that ever ran this card. We'll probably see a higher presence of this in Frostbite midrange now as well. But of course, Reputation is an archetype that exists as well. It's not one that we talk about a lot in the tournament space. It hasn't had any like crazy breakout performances. Like it didn't win a seasonal that no one expected it to. And ultimately, I'm very unfamiliar with the deck as a result. And it does have, it's gotten a lot of support lately. A lot of new cards have been coming the way of Reputation every set. It's got a couple of new landmarks, both the Apothecary. That's actually going to give you infinite value against a control deck because every time one of your five attack unit dies, it replaces itself with a random five attack unit in your hand, as well as of course the Rally landmark that we've gotten. So maybe with those two things combined, Reputation actually does have what it takes to sort of scrounge through a control meta, but I doubt it because the hallmark of the Reputation units is that they have very high attack points and very low health points. And I'm just, I don't think that the Bloody Business buff is necessarily going to do a whole lot for them in that regard, especially if, we, you know, we're going to continue to talk about this under the assumption that we're moving into a control-centric meta, then 
you know, the, the bloody business doesn't really mean much. Like, you can kill the Heimer for cheaper, you know, if you manage to get off five, four or five attack strikes by the turn that the Heimerdinger is coming down, which is unlikely because you're playing against a ping deck and you have five ones and stuff like that. But, you know, it, it's cool for Frostbite midrange. It's cool for reputation. But again, uh, just not a change that I expect to be incredibly high impact this patch. But it's it's definitely a st like it, it's one of those things that is just continuing to add on to the weight of frostbite midrange uh, and eventually that camel's back is going to break and we're going to get flooded with frostbite midrange but I, I don't think that time is now so i'm a big targon fan i'm a big invoke fan always going to be happy to see the star shaping nerf reverted and targon has a very interesting competitive history where for the every event for the last year every seasonal and the world championship targon has had a top three deck last season it was winding light before that it was aphelios and pantheon before that it was lee sin before that it was zoe nami but it's been a while since it was a star shaping deck that was the top Targon dog. And, and they consistently have one deck and then the rest of the region absolutely sucks. And it's like the least played region at that event. So I think last season, yeah, at the last season, all Winding Light was literally the only Targon deck that was played. So I don't want people to have this false conception that like Targon's a very good region and doesn't deserve these buffs. So I'm excited to get a little bit of power back into the rest of the region, not just whatever happens to be broken at the time, which historically is just Aphelios shit, because like Zoe Nami was a Crescendum deck, Lee Sin was a Crescendum deck, then we rebuffed Aphelios and all of a sudden Aphelios is back online and then Pantheon, like it's always just been like Zenith Blade and Crescendum has been the crux of Targon. So I'm very happy to see those cards, like at least, yeah, those those two cards effectively removed from the game. And now we have to find something else to get back to Targon. I'm very happy that Invoke is the direction that we went because I think it's the most fun. I think it's very flavorful. Um, I don't, I'm a little reserved though because I, I do remember the Ophelios Temple days where I had to sit here and cast Targon Mirrors for like 35 minutes while everybody just held onto their star shapings for dear life instead of playing them to find a great beyond and throw it at their opponent. So I'm cognizant of that. My hope is that the game has sped up naturally enough to a point at, at, at this stage where I'm not going to have to cast 35 minute Targon Mirrors, where players are going to have other avenues to kill each other. Maybe Aphelios helps with that. Um, there's certainly no Veiled Temple around to hurt it, so I'm cautiously optimistic about rebuffing all of these Targon cards. I'm certainly going to play it, but... I think that the star shaping buff, again, is, is impactful just because it is a card that was going to go into these invoke lists anyway. So the fact that it is just strictly better now, especially while like aggro is still something that I think players are kind of looking at in a big way, you know, with the NAR buff, with just the new pirate builds, with the new spider builds, all this stuff. I think that that one extra health uh, definitely going to feel good because it's not just one extra health. Usually you're playing like two, maybe even all three copies of star shaping over the course of the game. So it does add up to like two or three health, but you know, now I don't feel as bad about, like, not running Guiding Touch. And that does open up deck building space a little bit, which we're going to need if we are going to fit Starbone in there, at least for, like, initial builds. So, yeah, very very happy with the direction that the, the devs are taking Targon. This is the this is what I was talking about earlier. I'm pretty sure none of this shit matters. So the Dusk Petal Dust Change is cool. Uh, it is a typo on the patch notes. It's the next Nightfall card that you play, not just the next card that you play. But this barely even matters for Nightfall. Like, it's it's big because every deck that plays a Lunari Duskringer plays Pale Cascade. And, like, that is an interaction that myself and many other players have found ourselves in. Where, like, we just need to play the Dust and then play the Pale Cascade. Now we get to do it for one less mana. Always going to love that. But even for Nightfall, there's only, like, four spells in the game that actually say Nightfall. It's Pale Cascade, Unspeakable Horror, Unto Dusk, and Moonlight Affliction. Oh, and Heavens Aligned. But... You know, when we talk about the playable ones outside of like Nightfall decks, like dedicated Nightfall decks, it's like Pale Cascade and sometimes Moonlight Affliction. So that's cool and all. Uh, really not a lot to say about this one because it is a very quality of life change. If any buff to invoke feels like overkill, it's probably the Traveler buff because first of all, with Starbone, this is a four mana five five that gets you another card. Now, that's not as big a deal as it used to be, because uh, a while ago things were changed, so now the Traveler cannot invoke the Traveler, so you're not going to get, like, Traveler trained for 20 damage all of a sudden. But one of the weaknesses of Invoke always has been sort of low trading power, sort of low power level in general, until you get to the heavy hitters with two lives, like the Destroyer and the Immortal Fire and the Great Beyond, like the, spell shield, the two Spell Shield guys and then the Immortal Fire who has the two lives in a different way. Until you got to that, there wasn't a lot of power behind what Invoke was doing. And now the Traveler just moving up to 4 attack puts a lot more pressure on your opponent, as well as gives a lot more trading power than the deck previously had. Now, there's not an insane amount of things that have 4 health that, like, you were, you know, 
really kind of like looking to kill previously. But, you know, all of a sudden, a Pale Cascade and a Starbone and my Traveler's killing Kaisas that chose to block it or, or something along those lines. Whereas previously, that was so far outside of the wheelhouse. Um, ultimately, I, 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 it's just like, I'm fine with it. It feels like a cool change, and I'm all for Invoke having the ability to end games a little bit faster. I don't think this really, like, breaks the deck, but if, like, you probably didn't have to do this one. And this is one of those things that continues to, like, push in my mind that, like, Invoke will probably be, a, like, a top five deck for the seasonal tournament. It's just, like, how many things they got, all of which are very good. Um, so, yeah, I'm, ex I'm excited for the Traveler uh, buff, but, you know, th this definitely didn't feel like it was needed. The Squeaker buff is, is nothing. Um, this is actually Squeaker's second buff. It used to be a 1-1. One, one. Um, this this little fun editor's note, though, about, like, um, you know, don't don't squeal. Uh, talking, you know, kind of poking fun at uh, people who have been leaking patch notes and shit. I managed to avoid all the leaks. And initially, I was going to do this patch rundown as, like, blind. I was just going to, like, record it the first time that I saw it. And, like, I, I intentionally, like, avoided the leaks so that I could do a blind patch rundown. And then I thought about it, and I realized how, like dumb a blind patch rundown is because the whole point of doing something like this is i want to give you as much wisdom as i can like if i'm doing a blind patch rundown then i'm just kind of doing it to like oh here's boulevards here's where boulevards said something really smart here's where boulevards said something really dumb whereas if i take this and i digest it for a few hours because like now it's like seven o'clock at night i've had these patch notes for like six hours at this point um it, it feels a lot better and i feel like i can kind of condense my thoughts and get you guys more informed content which is better than more reactionary content Testing this initially brought a lot of apprehension to the team, but afterwards we felt the meta is in a position to handle an enhanced mare. Me too. Comms lead for Legends of Runeterra, me too. Bandal City and Targon, for the last meta or two, have been the lowest performing regions in terms of play rate uh, from ladder. I don't know if that pushed itself into tournaments, but I feel like it did. And it's been a while since we've had anything that felt like it would have been a mare deck. And I think that with Mare only giving a cost reduction to the first card played each turn, um, then it's fine to kind of improve his stats a little bit, give the survivability back. Because with, again, Bandle Tree being effectively removed from the game, with Tenor of Terror being nerfed, with Loping Telescope being nerfed, even if we go back to, like, an aggressive Bandle City deck, like, if we get, like, Narzigs back, right? I don't, I don't know that that would be a Mare deck, because you don't want to main deck Tenor, you don't want to main deck Telescope anymore. I don't remember if they main deck Telescope initially, but they probably did because it was just a two-mana two attack unit that got them a card like i'm looking at right now all of the multi-region followers that we have and a lot of these just don't look main deckable anymore so i'm i think mayor's like in a pretty okay spot grandfather fey leaps out to me as sort of the best one in terms of multi-region followers that we can play and really take advantage of the mayor but again because it is just one per turn i'm, I'm not really as concerned with it I think Bandle City, like Targon, just got kind of over nerfed in a lot of areas. Or not, not even necessarily over nerfed, because every time Bandle City was good, it was just so much better at everything else at what it was doing. And we finally got to a point where it feels like Bandle City is either broken or unplayable. And I. We're never going to get out of that situation unless we slowly start to buff some of the more impactful cards. Because we've we've buffed a lot of the unplayable Bandle City cards, and it hasn't done anything. So, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll take this. Better this than them, like, giving the plus one health back to, like, Yordle Explorer in terms of, like, giving Yordles plus one, plus one. Um, once they start, like, if they give Yordle Explorer back the plus one, plus one, it's over, man. Bandle City's back on the map. But for now, I think that, like, Poppy's been really reeled in. Telescope barely exists anymore. I, I think that, like, with Bandle Tree being gone, Mayor is definitely a pretty safe card to give a buff like this over to. And I'm not expecting any new decks to spawn out of this. So Neverglade Collector is not an unplayable card in the historical sense. Like it actually did see play in a very good deck uh, when people first started to put Sejuani in Endure Spiders. And I believe the champion combination was Callista Sejuani. Um, Neverglade Collector actually had quite a bit of impact because it was your only way to proc damage on your opponent's Nexus on your off turns so that you could level up the Sejuani and you know just sort of get into the range of actually like frostbiting your opponent by the way that you set up your attackers and stuff it was pretty cool i, I don't think neverglade collector gaining an extra health is what would push him in i think you probably have to go down to four mana so i'm not really expecting anything out of this collector buff because again i'm, I'm not like i'm very disrespectful of husks and that archetype as a whole i don't think neverglade collector gaining an extra health is like even compounded with the other buffs that we've gotten is really going to do anything there i think we need to see a lot more 
pushed into the Husk archetype to put Evelyn or any of these other cards on the map. Battle Bonds, now a bad back-to-back. -back. It is still Grant, but this is just not the direction that Targon is going. You're not putting this in a Targon deck. Benny Mone, Mo Boney Mone. I'm sure Shellfuck players are going to look at this, but again, it doesn't really feel like a deck or a buff for us, for the competitive community. I know that like Pranks is a very fun archetype for uh, people that are like newer to Rune Terror or just like really want to play casually. So like, sure, but I, I don't think like an extra health even makes Shellfuck players look at that. Again, not a buff for us, but it did just look weird that Trundle uh, was like did so much more than Scar Maiden Reaver at the same cost and had an extra health. This is a buff for us, though. Mini Morph got kind of power crept out of the meta. I'm trying to remember the extent of the nerfs that Darkness took. And I don't think they were extremely substantial. I think it was mostly just Twisted Catalyzer. And I know that, as I've learned recently, Darkness is just like one of the most hated decks in Runeterra, apparently. But I'm excited for Darkness to get to play in the control meta. And maybe it didn't need this buff to do that. And I think that this probably pushes it at least into contention where you can have a little bit of diversity within the control lineups because without Darkness, I'm thinking of like what control decks we had that can really like round out a lineup and like Jace Heimer goes in everyone's lineup and then you probably have a Shadow Elf earlier deck in there, almost certainly FTR. And then when we look at that last control spot, like Conservatory took a nerf, so it is probably just going to be Shadow Elf. And assuming we're just talking Shadow Elf control, then it's probably going to be Shirima Viego, right? And now we do have a fourth Shadow Isle control deck that can really kind of push its way into that trifecta. What players aren't going to love is that the more control decks you have, the more popular control is going to be, the more the issue or the decks that have issues with control decks are going to be pushed out like Frostbite midrange. So I think there's a Twisted Catalyzer buff is is cool. It's pretty well timed. You know, if we are going to go into a control meta, I would like to have a few more options in the control decks that I want to be playing especially because Darkness does a very good job of sort of outgrinding other control decks because, you know, Senna and Vigar both have four health. It's one of the decks that still plays Rekindler. It can play Ruination. It has this burn strategy. Um, Mist's Call does very well against other control decks. Like, I think that Darkness can be built to really outgrind the other control decks in a sort of um, interesting and fun to watch way where the games get to end a lot sooner, where I, I don't really want my control mirrors to last 45 minutes. I, I'm fine if they only take 15. And I think darkness is really going to help balance that out within the control V control lineups. So, um, but I also just really like darkness. I'm a big fan of the deck. So um, I might be a little bit biased on that one, but uh, very, very happy to see Catalyzer get his attack back. So now that we're moving into nerfs, things should actually move along a little bit faster. I don't have as much to say about nerfs. It's just kind of like, okay, this deck is dead or this deck isn't, or like this is a slap on the wrist, so on and so forth. Like this is a slap on the wrist. Alawi at six health is like nearly unkillable. At five is mostly unkillable. So, you know, it's it, you're going to feel it, but I don't think this like kills Alawi by any stretch of the imagination. Tentacle Smash is an unfortunate nerf where I think you are going to find yourself in a classic situation where this card needs to spawn 2.5 to be balanced, where the main issue with it wasn't in Alawi decks, it was in non-Alawi decks, where just any Bilgewater deck was playing this as a four mana removal spell that could also potentially leave you with a leftover 3-1 or 3-2. And it was just a little bit too much for every Bilgewater deck to have access to that when it's not really like a core identity of Bilgewater. The problem is this does really hamper the removal of the Alawi decks. Now, this does mean that we have to move away from Bard Alawi, but Alawi Lux was sort of the number two Alawi deck, and you can get removal out of Demacia from that, so you're not as reliant on Tentacle Smash. And this will also slow down like the turbo level of Alawi, which I'm okay with, especially given that, you know, if you are playing an Alawi deck, you have like five copies of Tentacle Smash because you have Alawi's Tentacle Smash. So ultimately, I think it was like needed. I, I think it's a little unfortunate what it does to the Alawi archetype, especially because like Bard Alawi is almost certainly going to be removed from the game. Alawi wasn't doing great outside of Bard before that combination kind of showed up, but that was before we had Riptide Sermon. So I am a little curious to see if uh, Alawi Lux now gets to sit in this meta now that it has a six mana spell that synergizes. But um, again, I think the Tentacle Smash actually does hurt the Lux variant as well quite a bit, more so than this would have hurt like Bard Alawi. So ultimately, very unfortunate for Alawi, but it, it kind of is what it is. It, it definitely felt necessary because it was just taking over Bill's water way too much, way too much. The Bard nerf feels good. A lot of people were talking about changing Bard to round end instead of round start, which I mean, obviously like the math works out a little bit better. 
uh, you'd be down like three chimes the whole game. Now you're down six chimes the whole game uh, on top of the fact that you just cannot hit organically turn one or two, which is fine because people tend to have a high presence of the bard curve, which is beard into Esmus. So they were hitting chimes turn one and two anyway. So I'm ultimately fine with bard getting toned down a bit. I think that there aren't really any champions that synergize with bard to the point where it's an ideal pairing where he is going to survive this nerf for this meta maybe down the line we'll get a new champion or just a new sub archetype within a region that really meshes with the bard but for now it's going to be sidelined for a bit which is fine he's not the most interesting champion that we have although i would say he is far and away best the, the best rune terra champion that we had um so a little unfortunate there definitely the most diverse because i think Jin and evelyn are the only other two so r.i.p soldier you did your work you got a lowey nerf for some reason a little unfortunate but yeah bard was just doing way too much and i think people are going to be fine to put this one down for a while and, and just not really think about it. It, it it's probably like more fine than we're giving it credit for and i don't think we'll find anything broken about bard going into this seasonal but you know next expansion drops and no one thinks about bard and then three weeks in someone comes up with a bard deck is kind of where i see him coming back into this the kaisa nerfs runeterra has a, a bad habit of taking a problematic deck and slapping it on the wrist and then sort of quote unquote ruining a seasonal because of it where the best deck from before that everybody hated is still the best deck and, and just nothing you know whatever you did wasn't enough and i am rather worried that that's what we're seeing out of the Kaisa nerfs. Obviously, like, second skin to slow is, is pretty big because now I can actually kill the little bird before you can get scout and challenger on every copy of Kaisa. I would have liked to see second skin not grant those keywords to Kaisas everywhere. Sort, sort of like Victor, but I'll, I'll take this, I guess. I think everybody knew that, like, second skin was going to slow. Supercharge to four. It, okay, that does mean something because there were a lot of games that I lost because... You know, my opponent, ha like, on turn four, they blinding assault. And then turn five, they, like, summon Kaisa and supercharge the bird. And then second skin it. And all of that happens at focus speed. And now all of a sudden, that's that's five keywords right there. Scout, challenger, overwhelm, spell shield, quick attack. So, like, as long as they randomly farted another unit onto the battlefield in the first four turns of the game, I was just, you know, kind of screwed from there. But, like, Supercharge wasn't really seeing main deck play outside of it. A, a lot of people were very worried about this card, just kind of taking over the game, especially with the high presence of Papercraft Dragon in the previous season. And this just really didn't do much there. So I am kind of okay with this prevent, like, almost preventative nerf, where this doesn't really feel like a, a Kaisa nerf as much as it feels like a, this card was eventually going to be a problem regardless of whether or not Kaisa existed. So I'll take that. But ultimately, I think I would have liked to see them be a little more heavy-handed with Kaisa. I'm not entirely sure in what direction I would have liked to see that, but I, I just think that the champion still levels too consistently and too quickly. Uh, you're going to see it too consistently on turn five if you're playing it as a mono. Most people play it mono. Mono Kaisa, that is. And I don't, I don't know, man. I'm, I'm just worried that this is not enough and we're still just going to see Kaisa completely dominate the seasonal. But, you know, you hit the things that, like, you hit parts of her that were resilient to control but uh most importantly like second skin being um slow instead of focus so i can wait for you to play it and then kill the unit in responses to previously like yes i could kill the blinding assault before you could second skin it but then you could just second skin something else um so i am i am happy about that and we'll kind of see how it goes you know it might just end up being like a control meta plus kaisa and then we just ban kaisa so I, w I wish they were a little bit more heavy-handed. I am very worried about this just being a Kaisa-dominated seasonal and leaving a very bad taste in everyone's mouth because then the expansion releases and they don't nerf anything. And then, um, you know, we have to wait another four weeks. And it's just like, I, I, I don't think people really want another six weeks of Kaisa, myself included. Blighted Ravine. This, like, this is barely a nerf, right? So it doesn't heal you for four. It heals you for two. But it also doesn't hit you for two. So you're still netting the same amount of health in 90% of circumstances. And it doesn't hit face anymore. Now, I have killed people with Blighted Ravine a fair amount of times. But I think that, for the most part, this card is, is ultimately pretty unchanged. Um, in terms of, like, what it's going to do for, like, FTR, Thralls was probably the one that felt like it cared about the most about the over-the-top damage. 
or you know in those rare circumstances where like you need to play it for the immediate burst of healing and then kill your opponent before the turn actually ends but ultimately i think bladed ravine is going to be in a very similar position if you were hoping for blighted ravine to get removed from the game i have terrible news for you i don't expect this card's play rate to really shift at all um but there were more important nerfs to thrall specifically it's just frozen thrall going to nine which feels right because i've played quite a bit of thralls this season it's what i climbed a diamond with and these things come out way too fast <laughs> way too fast so I think the Thralls are actually going to continue to be fine. So initially, they got the slap on the wrist, which felt like more than a slap on the wrist, which was sort of the uh, removing of promising future from the meta. That felt like more than a slap on the wrist, but it wasn't. The, the win rate of Thralls went up from there because all the bad players dropped Thralls because they were like, oh, he got nerfed, drop it. And then all the good players that knew how to play Thralls were like, we didn't even need promising future because Sansa time is just so broken. And uh, also, uh, what is it? Squall of the Thralls or something? The bird. Squall of the Thralls. That's not its name, but it'd be Harbinger of Thralls. Like, the new cards for Thralls just did such a good job of really uh, sort of invalidating the nerf to Promising Future. And I think that if we are moving towards a control meta, then even with this new slap on the wrist, Thralls could have a very good spot in the tournament scene still. Now, typically they're supposed to be very advantaged against control. But we've seen it go the other way a lot in tournament to the point where like Jace Heimer players are just not even banning Thralls. They'll continue to ban whatever the other deck is. I think uh, Winding Light most often, or not, not Winding Light, but whatever like the third deck is. And they'll just like leave Winding Light and Thralls. And it's like, those are the two big scary decks of the format. Um, and, and I think the stats on like Thralls versus Control are actually a little bit skewed by random ladder players that just like don't know how to play Control against Thralls. And Control has actually felt like it's, it's done pr pretty fine against Thralls when the good players get their hands on Control. So I I'm curious to watch this one. I think that I think that Thralls are going to be like... It's, it's hard to say. I'll need more data on this one. I'll need a little bit more time. Because like this nerf is impactful. But I think that Thralls crushing Control was a little overstated. So I don't think it just like automatically gets to stick around because I expect us to move into a control meta. So, you know, we'll, we'll kind of see. We'll monitor that one. We'll keep an eye on it. But definitely uh, the countdown up to nine is, is actually like really big. Because there are a lot of times where like you get those thralls exactly as you need them. Uh, and there's really not a lot of additional countdown that you can put in the deck. So it's kind of stuck back a turn. Just gives, you know, control and all that like more time to build up. And yeah, I, I don't think thralls is, is going to really be able to like keep up. Um, so if I had to like pick a decide, I'd say like thralls is probably out. So the Station Archivist uh, nerf is is like not really a nerf. Uh, so what this does is with the Oxshot Infinite combo, because you were looking for the Warlord's Horde spell, um, you could just sit there and like see it's in your top five and grab it and then like play it because you know you, you've got another one coming up soon. Or if you didn't see one, then you could like play a predict spell and, and get a new hand basically. Uh, so this doesn't really impact the the decks around it i actually like this change a lot because there were a lot of times where like you'd look at your spells coming up and you'd be like wow these kind of suck so i'm actually like really fine with this i wouldn't even necessarily call it a nerf it is just a little bit different like it does matter because now you don't have the information and things like that and your opponent doesn't have the information either because they would get to see how many spells popped up on the station archivist to know like oh they're top decking spells or they're not top decking any spells from here on out like i don't have to worry about a top deck vengeance or anything like that so i do like the randomness of the shuffle being added back into it boom boom boom's going down to a two one I don't know that this one felt particularly needed because we already nerfed Winding Light. Not in a huge way, but that was sort of the premier Boom Baboon deck. Draven Scion being the other one. And then I guess like, you know, Vi Bard and Jinx Bard, but you already nerfed Bard. So I think that Boom Baboon was definitely a high play rate PNZ card, but I don't think it was like a nerfably high play rate PNZ card. I think that the trading power on it was actually fine. I'd rather see you turn this into a 2-2 than a 2-1. Like, I definitely think Boom Baboon got a little over-nerfed here, especially when we look at, like, the fact that you already nerfed Reggie and Ballistic Bot. And I've gotten so used to calling him Reggie, I can't even remember his name anymore. Yeah, I can't, I cannot remember his name. He's just Reggie to me now. But yeah, I definitely feel like Boom Baboon got a, a pretty bad hit here. Especially because Scion has, like, kind of constantly been on the cusp. 
And this definitely feels like it's more nerfed at something like uh, Winding Light, which is the one that cared more about. Or, or really just like Boom 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 is really paying for the crimes of these like turn seven finisher decks that we're looking to get as like much chip damage in early as possible, like Scion and, and Winding Light specifically. And I think that the card was interesting enough within other discard archetypes that it, I don't know, this, this doesn't feel good to me. Um, especially as a 2-1, like, at least make it a 2-2. Two -two. Give it a little bit of trading power in the early game. And it is what it is. So this, the Ravenbloom Conservatory nerf definitely feels more like a ladder nerf. I know Annie TF was, like, one of the highest play rate decks last season, and then Katarina TF and Annie TF probably maintained, like, a top three play rate this season if you combine them, because they were effectively the same deck. But in tournament, Conservatory has never been crazy. We've seen players come in with, like, triple Conservatory lineups and, like, do okay, or, like, do even pretty well, but, like, it didn't feel like a problem, and now the possibility of getting Tybulk on curve is really just, like, non-existent and continues to sort of push the issue of just not drawing Raven Bloom early because it, it took a lot to get this thing to Countdown 10 in hand, and now, like, yeah, Riptide Rex will still do it for you, but if you're drawing your Raven Bloom after you've played a Riptide, like, you're in a bit of a weird spot anyway. Uh, this definitely, like... I, th I think this will do a lot to kind of push the already fringe conservatory decks out of tournaments, not entirely, but just continue to like eke down that play rate, or at least bring it more in line with what it was when Annie TF was the only variant, because Annie TF was like the most popular ladder deck in the World Walker season on like awful in tournament. And then this Katarina version popped up and it started to do a little bit better. And now I think we're gonna like look more at what the Annie TF play rate looked like, which was apparently like bigger in Europe. Um, but ultimately, you know, just kind of like lowers the, uh, the potential future of this card, which w was pretty high, so yeah, I'm not in love with this nerf. But again, it, it's not really um, my area, I guess. Like this wasn't this wasn't a tournament nerf. This was a ladder nerf. As a bit of a preventative measure, since we're hitting everything else that's on top, might as well take aim at a zero Aurelia as well, which is what the stagehand nerf feels like. Because I don't I don't know how popular stagehand is in a zero Aurelia, but I see it a, a fair amount. So the fact that I can mystic shot it now feels okay and like they said there, there was no real reason for an ephemeral to have four health other than you can't mystic shot it and they were like wow you know taking four damage with a mystic shot in hand doesn't feel great so you can do that now and then defiant dance felt like the most broken card in zero really to me for quite some time uh, maybe not as much now that domination has come out but i haven't even actually seen as much zero really this meta as i have in the past with uh, domination coming out but a lot of the times that i was trying to build decks and i was like okay do i auto lose to a zero Aurelia? The question I always had to ask myself was kind of like, do they have Defiant Dance for when I play my expensive unit? And if the answer was yes, then I just died on the spot. Because, you know, usually they have at least a Dias, maybe an Azir, if Domination's out as well. Like, I'm just taking an insane amount of damage and getting punished for just trying to play a unit on curve. Because spells in Legends of Runeterra resolve as much as possible, I couldn't even, like, dodge it with an Hourglass or, like, a Recall effect or something. The Blade Dances are still coming out. I have one less blocker. I definitely feel like the Defiant Dance nerf is what I would have liked to see them take aim at in Azir Aurelia. I think that, the like, Aurelia has been hit too much already. Blade Dance still being two mana is, like, what's keeping that deck in check. I don't want to see that hit further, but I do think that like Defiant Dance was sort of the uh, one of the less interesting cards in the deck that was also just very front loaded. So I'm I'm happy to see that one go down to five mana. But again, Azira Aurelia hasn't been doing a lot in tournament, and if we are moving into a control meta, then Azira Aurelia actually would have like been really really good. It tends to be resilient to control just because of like how low the ground is. Azira is hard to deal with. Leveled Aurelia is very difficult to deal with. There's no interaction for Emperor's Dias. So I am happy to see a little bit of a preemptive hit here, especially because they are hitting areas of the deck that were not dominating the control matchup, right? Like Defiant Dance against Control is kind of whatever. That's more where like all your little shitters come into play. So I like to see them keep the anti-control aspects of Azir Aurelia sort of at full power. I, I don't think the Ancient Hourglass nerf was enough, if I'm being honest. We look back at a curious journey. Prodigy wins with Triple Shurima, the opponent crafty one on double Shurima plus a Aphelios. And everybody in the competitive community seemed to collectively agree during the Curious Journey Seasonal that Ancient Hourglass was the best card in the game. And then nothing happened to it. And the more that I've just kind of like played against Kaisa or like played Runeterra in general, I've started to hold the opinion that hard protection should not be available for spell mana. So, uh, like we moved to Nye from three mana to four, 
Bastion only lasted, I think, a patch at three mana before we moved it to four. Uh, you released Rite of Negation at four mana instead of three, even though it has downside. Well, it has upside too, but I, I just think that if you play a unit on curve and I vengeance it, that should work almost every time. And Hourglass has hands down been the single biggest pain point for me against Kaisa, where people would be like, oh yeah, like just vengeance the Kaisa. So I'd queue up a vengeance deck on ladder and my I literally had a sub 50% success rate against Kaisa by vengeancing it. Like my vengeance is resolved less than half the time because I just kept getting Hourglass. So having hard protection available for spell mana still, just like on curve with your unit, doesn't feel great to me, especially because Hourglass, unlike Deny and Rite of Negation, can dodge Challenger. So it's just another avenue of dealing with your unit on curve that is taken away from me. And I really feel like Hourglass kind of should have been four mana. Or the change that I actually think I would have really liked to see is you move Hourglass to four mana, but you give it an option to be two mana if you play it at slow speed. So you make it kind of like a modal spell, right? Where if you play this at slow speed, it's two mana. If you play it at fast speed, it's four mana. And I don't think that's a mechanic we have in Legends of Runeterra yet, but I think it could be very interesting and still allow for um, sort of cheaper combos with cards like Talia and Zareth and really maintain its landmark identity without being an overloaded protection spell. So if anyone from Legends of Runeterra is watching, that is my suggested change for Hourglass if it does prove to still be a problem in the future, which I imagine it will, uh, because three mana hard protection is still just very, very good. And if we are moving into a control meta, you know what does very well in control metas? Hourglass decks. So yeah, we'll, we'll see how it goes. See how it goes. You know, like Sundisk could even come back in a big way if we are moving into like triple control. Um, th like there are answers to triple control, right? So we'll see how it goes. But uh, yeah, it, it's one of those things where like, we only have 10 days to adapt to the meta. So if it is triple control, like, is everybody going to figure that out and like, you know, next level it? And then like, what's the next level of that? Like, wh where do we end up in time for the seasonal? Um, and with Jace Heimer just like being so proactive and aggressively postured and Viego having the possibility to do the same thing and maybe not so much FTR, but like Darkness having the ability to like play proactive and stuff. I think that the control decks are are proactive enough that like maybe Sundisk doesn't doesn't get to do it right doesn't get its free matchup in, in the same way that thralls does it right where like it's the deck has just been slowed down enough that control plays faster the landmark decks play a little bit slower it doesn't line up as cleanly as it used to but that's that winding light losing overwhelm a lot of people were asking for this one i'm pretty fine with it i think that you should have to maintain a really wide board to push through damage with winding light and this doesn't really hurt the double winding lights in any way like where i winding light and that doesn't kill you and then i play another one like you're still giving wine like overwhelm to the second winding light it's still turning into an eight seven overwhelm so i think like that's fine uh winding light wasn't in a great spot anyway because of like a kathy and rain although at the online league series last weekend we did have a winding light mirror in the finals so i am curious to see how this plays out but the nerf to boom baboon on top of this feels like a lot um I don't really have strong feelings about the Winding Light deck and, and where I think it's really going to end up. If we do move control-oriented, not great for Winding Light. Not great by any stretch of the imagination, especially now that I can like block your 6-5 with a Spiderling. So, yeah, I, I could definitely see it getting pushed out by what's about to come. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think if I had to guess, I'd say Winding Light's getting pushed out. And then Papercraft Dragon. Yeah, uh... <laughs> Papercraft really really blew up, and a lot of people kind of knew it was a problem. It hasn't seen really any play this meta. The Papercraft decks really got pushed out by Kaisa, so taking a little bit of the wind out of Kaisa's sails does mean that Papercraft could have made a big comeback, so I am happy to see them really lower the curve on this and not let me just get Renekton into Papercrafted. So, you know, pretty, pretty happy about that, but ultimately this feels more preventative than doing anything in the actual meta and again papercraft was another deck where like you know control doesn't deal with this phenomenally you know especially if you like get a ruin runner down and then you papercraft it and now like 
Previously, you had Ruin Runner into Papercraft with Rite of Negation mana. Now you just have Ruin Runner into Papercraft. I think it, it really hampers that deck's ability to play against control. And just like the more I go through this patch, the more it seems like things are just really pushing in, in the control favor. And even the things that were supposed to beat it are just getting slowed down enough that controls more proactive win conditions that they find themselves with in 2022 are, are going to be enough to really kind of outpace the meta and maybe we ne maybe we never get to level two it maybe like level one is control and like there just is no level two or like level two is a touch too slow or like loses to everything else so yeah i, th I think it's, it's pretty clear wh what direction we're heading in so yeah that is patch 3.13 as i said we're moving into a control meta that's almost certain uh, whether or not we get to level two, it is, is a big question point. But with the Mastering and Terra series coming up this weekend, we'll get a pretty good idea immediately. I don't think a lot of the buffs matter too much outside of the Invoke ones. The Invoke buffs I am very optimistic for, though. Like I said, I, I expect that to be a top five deck at the seasonal. Um, I, I am worried that Kaisa is still just going to be everywhere. But Kaisa wasn't as everywhere as she probably should have been. Where, you know, she was only taking up like half of a top eight. And usually that's where our strongest deck lies, is like they'll take half the top eight consistently every now and then they'll grab like five spots. Sometimes they'll only grab like three spots. And that's kind of where Kaisa was sitting. She wasn't like overperforming for a best deck in tournament. So hopefully this little slap on the wrist helps, but like everything at the top got nerfed. So it's, it's going to shake things up for sure, right? Just because everything at the top got hit. Because it was really just like Bartolawi thralls and, well, not everything because Jace Heimer is still going to be Jace Heimer, and now Darkness was brought back into the fray. But yeah, like I, I'd say like Jace Heimer is the biggest winner of the patch because they lost nothing and a lot of their competition did. So that's what you should be learning. Monkeys also didn't get hit at all. We knew monkeys weren't going to get hit at all because they didn't start popping up until after the patch drop, but we haven't... Like, monkeys had a good opening weekend, and like somebody won the MR tournament with triple monkeys, but they've seemed pretty tame so far. And if we are moving to um, a, a control meta, then like... You know, you just have to play Withering Whales for Monkeys, and then you're probably fine. i say, as someone who has never played Monkeys versus Control from either side of the table, so that might be a little bit too straightforward, where it's like, oh, yeah, just Withering Whale the Monkeys, and it's like, no, it's so much more complicated than that. That's not how it works. Um, so, yeah, that, that'll be interesting to see, but I think that, like, Jace Heimer, big winner. Monkeys, kind of a big winner, but I'm not sure, like, where they really kind of stood anyway, so... Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. Anyway, that is going to do it for me. I have been Boulevard. Uh, catch me later this week with another tournament tier list for the opening weekend of patch 3.13. And then next week, I will have the seasonal edition of the Tournament Tactician that everybody seems to love and helps people out a lot. And that'll be next Wednesday. So thank you so much for watching. I know this was a bit of a long one. If you stuck through to the end, I appreciate that. 